Coming up on this week in Radio Tech, we're talking to Kevin Bunty. He's the chief engineer at a small market group of radio stations, AM, FM, and TV station, too, talking about virtualization. You know how small markets sometimes move to new technologies because they have to before the big markets do. We're talking about it coming up on Twerked. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and everything in between. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and I'm not in my usual um, Telos Alliance branded <clears throat> studio in Nashville. No, I'm actually at the mothership today. <laughs> I'm at the Telos Alliance in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm uh, I'm here. We are uh, me and my colleagues have been um, preparing for the big NAB show, and so we've been you know racking equipment, configuring it, making sure all the IP addresses are right. Ooh, man, is that a job? Uh, I mean, we we basically in three days we basically built uh, three and a half studios worth of gear, and uh, four studios actually, and um, and did a whole uh, Telos VX system, uh, and got you know telephony in, into all the studios. Of course, all this goes into a booth at NAB. We also, at the same time, uh, built, configured, uh, and racked up the uh, gear for the Broadcast Asia show. Uh, it takes a lot longer to get the gear over to Singapore, so that has to get done about the same time as the, as the NAB show prep. So there's a big old truck arriving here in a few days. <laughs> It'll take away the crates and uh, mosey them out west to uh, Las Vegas. So anyway, that's where I am today. I'm at the Telus Alliance in Cleveland, Ohio, and delighted to be here and glad that they give me a little time to, uh, to do this show and to bring you some great broadcast uh, equipment and technology education. All right, enough about me. Let's uh, head over to the East Coast where Chris Tobin is standing by. Hey, Chris, welcome in. How are you? I'm well. I'm doing well. I'm glad to hear you guys are getting ready for uh, NAB and everything's coming together. It's, what, it's just a short couple of weeks away. It's going to be fun. Yeah, is, what is it? Is it three weeks? Yeah, it's, it's about three weeks away, I suppose. Yeah, it's about uh, three weeks. We, yeah, we we have we have an advanced team that, uh, and I'll I'll be part of that this year. Going to get out there um, like about the Tuesday or Wednesday before NAB, and start. You know, we got to make. You know, one thing we have to do. <clears throat> people don't think about this, but uh, <clears throat> they're going to put carpet down on the floor, right? And they and they put down the carpet underlay. Um, we've got to specify the cables that run, you know, from one kiosk to another oh, where, you know, yes. the core switch is, you know, yeah, lots of cables to run. And um, <clears throat> inevitably, the contractors who do that don't always do it right. You know, they, they bind a cable or twist it or, or you get to where the kiosk is supposed to be and there's six, literally six inches of cable coming up out of the floor. You know, no, dude, we could use 10 feet of cable coming out of the floor. So, um, yeah, it's it's a little difficult. So, so we have to be on site when that cabling happens to um, try to make, make that right. So it's, it's always yeah, fun. Yeah, your, 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 your best bet is to make cable runs that have uh, Molex-type connectors at each end. So that when you get come up short on the carpet out exit, you just plug in the other end, extend it to your cabinet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, oh, we've done that. And, and, and part of the packing is those Ethernet uh, cable, uh, you know, mail-to-mail -mail adapters. So you can plug two Ethernet oh, yes, cables together. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. That that is definitely definitely in the in the road cases. Oh my goodness, we bring a bunch of cases. We have these big steel cases we've had for I don't know twenty five years or so, and they have survived a lot of NAB shows and, and other other shows as well, uh, yeah, like radio shows uh, too. Hey, uh, let's go ahead and bring in our guest here. Uh, our guest is a fellow who I met on Facebook just a few weeks ago, and I liked so much what he had to say about broadcast engineering that I said, Hey, Kevin. Uh, would you come and be on our show and talk to us about the technologies and the techniques that you're putting to use in what is ostensibly a, a reasonably small market? And so our guest is Kevin uh, Bunty. Kevin, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. Welcome, Kurt. Uh, you sure you got the right guy? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah. But no, it's, yeah, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, well, Kevin... Uh, 
I got interested in you because you were talking about virtualization and just to yeah. uh, foreshadow what's coming up and what you're going to be, what we're going to be talking about, maybe a little bit of what you're going to teach us is about uh, uh, virtualizing the broadcast infrastructure at a, at a small market uh, uh, radio station. And you've got a TV station there too, right? Correct. We're AM, FM, and TV. Uh, family owned. So we're kind of a rarity nowadays. So it's it's an honor to be working on that. You're in a uh, town it, that I've heard of before, um, but I don't exactly yeah. know where it is. Zanesville, Ohio. Tell us about that. At a, it's about an hour east of Columbus, Ohio. So if you were to hop from Cleveland down to 77, head west off of uh, on um, 70 there, and you'll run right into us. Ah, so, okay, okay. So kind of southeast. The best thing we're uh, known east. for is... The best thing we're known for is we have a bridge you can turn left or right onto. Uh, you can't go straight or you end up in the river. <laughs> okay. That's hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's to confusing look at times. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Turns. we're sometimes known as the Y City Bridge. Or yeah, we have the uh, Y City Bridge. What what is the what does the bridge go over? Uh it's three rivers, uh Coshocton, or two rivers, the Coshocton River the Shockton and the Muskingum River, and they flow into one, just the Muskingum River, and it continues on from there. But they built a bridge right as the rivers intersect into each other. Ah, okay, okay. So, so you can turn left and go over one and right or go over the other one. Exactly. Wow. So wow. it's kind of right. interesting. So we're going to be talking about virtualization, and uh, we've been doing a little bit of this at my radio station. We won't get all into it yet. We got to we're going to get through one of our a couple of sponsors here real quick. But what uh, what Kevin's going to be sharing with us is what I firmly believe, and I know that uh, Chris feels the same way, uh, is the future for broadcast infrastructure. We're going to get more and more away from purpose built equipment and more and more into. Uh, PCs that are running, you know, whatever operating system. A lot of them could be Linux. Some could be Windows, and uh, and these are going to be performing the jobs at broadcast facilities that we do now with uh, dedicated gear. Of course, a lot of the dedicated gear is already running software inside it. I mean, right behind me here. Take a look at this. This is a Telos VX system, and inside this is a little uh, system on module, a SOM. And it's running Linux, and then it's running the the VX app uh, and all the services, all the daemons uh, on top of that. Well, you can you can take this and run it on a regular server, and in fact, that's what the VX Enterprise has become. So, just an example uh, of of gear moving. Oh, and by the way, uh, at some point, that'll be available uh, as a virtual machine, um, a, a, a Docker or uh, whatever. Whatever format that people want it in, it'll be available in a, in a format that'll just plug right in onto a virtual mas machine infrastructure. So we'll talk about that. And uh, Kevin's doing that in a, in a small market. And that's exciting to see. That's where a lot of uh, innovation happens, it seems. Small markets first. Hey, our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at CalREC and Angry Audio. Let's hear from them. <laughs> CalREC's Type R is a modular, expandable IP-based radio system featuring three slimline panels, a fader panel, a large soft panel, and a small soft panel easily configured to give the operator full control. Layouts are saved and recalled quickly between shows. A single 2RU core with integrated I.O. gets customers up and running fast, and that single core can power up to three independent mixing environments with no sharing of DSP resources. Available in four DSP packs and as your station grows larger packs can be added enabling it to grow with you power to the surface is supplied via standard poe switches keeping cabling to a minimum type r is fully aes 67 compatible as defined by simpty 2110 which means that it is also compliant with nmos discovery and connection management specs all these features combined make type r the most flexible radio console you can buy find out more at calrec.com slash twerk I encourage you to go to that website, calrec.com slash twerk. If you're going to the NAB show, of course, you can take a look at the Calrec Type R right there. Ooh, angry audio. Hey, you know, studio guests are only human, and humans cough. They sniff and clear their throats, even on the air. Well, cure this with the angry audio guest gizmo. You can press the cough button, mute the mic. Every guest needs one. 
You know what else guests need? Well, they need headphones, which is why each guest gizmo has a studio quality headphone amp with individual volume control. Anything else? Well, you've seen those mic arms with the built-in LED tallies. They're gorgeous, but how do you get them to light up? Well, Guest Gizmo does that too, illuminating the red light whenever the mic is hot. And installing the Guest Gizmo in your studio furniture could not be easier. You just need that right there, a two and three quarter inch hole saw and a steady hand. No router required. Your studio gets a clean custom appearance and you get all the credit. Check out the Guest Gizmo and all the other cool gadgets at angryaudio.com. That's angryaudio.com. Check them out, would you? And thanks a lot to Angry Audio and Calrec slash twerk uh, to, uh, uh, to, for being our sponsors on This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Kevin Bunty is our guest, and we're going to jump right into this. Kevin, you had to have a, a start on this path to virtualization. I, and I guess first, tell you what, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier today to me that um, you've got about 50 virtual machines running, and that means you're not running 50 desktop PCs doing things. That means you don't have 50 fans and 50 power supplies and 50 spinning hard drives and 50 CPUs, individual CPUs, and all the other junk that, and cables and all that stuff. So give me an, an idea of, of, of uh, you know, just kind of what you've got virtualized, and, and uh, then we'll go on to uh, get you to tell a story about how you got to that point. So what's virtualized <laughs> at uh, WHIZ Radio oh. and TV? So the biggest thing that we have virtualized right now is our automation system. I'm actually looking at the screen right now. And we have uh, Broadcast Electronics Audio Vault Flex for our automation using the WheatNet 24 drive, 24 channel WheatNet driver. I apologize for that. And mm -hmm. we have two of those machines running, a primary and a backup, um, just like you would for any other reason. And so there we got that on there. Then we have our streaming computers. Then we have our email server, our phone system. Um, a mo we have PRTG that monitors all of our servers, our network switches, our point-to-point -point okay. links to our tower sites, just to make sure everything's behaving the way it's supposed to be. Uh, then we also have our TV automation, uh, a discrepancy board. So if there's anything wrong with programming or equipment, people can just post to there and I check it every morning and, or my assistants will go ahead and check it every morning and we'll see what we need to knock out first thing in the morning, get that taken care of. Uh, you could go on and on. <laughs> so I, and I think uh, earlier today you were telling me that also you have a number of uh, uh, sales and administrative yeah. um, uh, functions running in virtual machines and they access it from a small desktop computer on, on their desks. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have, uh, well, we have two wide orbit servers they're running on here. Um, we also have a uh, Marketron for trafficking, Music Master for music, and all they have to do is log on to a local desktop or a laptop, enter in their credentials, select the machine that they, or the software that they want to go to, and they log right into it and they're ready to go, just as if it was physically right in front of them. It's they know no other than an extra step of logging in. That's, that's it. They don't know that it's not physically in front of them other than they can go anywhere with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which I, I guess that means that they could do work um, from home if they needed to. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And actually we have a, uh, our TV sales manager. He was actually on a cruise out in the, uh, I think Pacific ocean and <laughs> And there was a problem with one of the clients. He logged in remotely, did his thing, just had no problem with it. He just paid for the internet access on the cruise ship. And wow. he had everything wow. in front of him. And, and you, you know, we've, we've been, he always tells me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've had remote access capability. I mean, hey, uh, back in the mid 90s, I, I worked for Scott Studios and, and we were using, I don't know, some, some maybe, maybe it was PC Anywhere, you know, something to, uh, to get us in, in, in remotely. And um, uh, so just getting it remotely isn't such a big deal, but, but doing it uh, into things that are, you know, I don't know, centrally located, that are common, that are on reliable hardware. And maybe we ought to talk about, uh, about this reliability factor, because on the one hand, oh, yeah. some people uh, don't want all their eggs in one basket, right? 
Uh, that seems, as broadcast engineers, we like having backup systems. We like having uh, liabilities spread around just a little bit. And so uh, maybe you can tell me about, you know, if I'm, if I'm wrongheaded in thinking that more computers somehow equals more reliability because the, the chances are spread out. Give me a, give me a little, you know, education on, on why a server system might be better. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a double-edged sword because, yeah, you do have a lot in just one basket. You know, we split it 50-50, you know, 25 machines per uh, virtual host. And then what we do on top of that is, as I mentioned before, we have our primary and backup automation system, and they're on two separate machines. So that way, if a machine ever were to fail, which it has happened before, the other system just kicks in and continues on just just as normal. I mean, exactly the way it's supposed to. Um, the only difference is instead of trying to scratch your heads, like why, why is this not working anymore? Is it the hard drive? Is it the memory? Did the power supply go bad? Did somebody trip over a power cable uh, or the network cable? And it, somebody spills something in the, somebody spills something in the keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, all you got to do, we use a uh, VMware for our, hypervisors and yeah. all I have to do is just say, Hey, move this machine down to this other host, start it back up. And so instead of you know, a couple of hours to a couple of days of trying to figure out what possibly could be wrong, I've spent five minutes and I got that system back up and running again. And then I can take mm -hmm. my time with level heads and figure out exactly what is wrong with this one particular machine. Um, plus yeah. the quality of hardware that you have. Oh, go ahead, Kurt. Oh, I was just saying in the second half of the show, I'd like to delve a little bit more into uh, how engineers like you and me can get educated on this. And, I, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm foreshadowing, alluding to your IT guy has been a lot of help to you. So that's a, a world that I, ha I didn't grow up in. But, man, there's plenty of people who have. We'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But go, go back to this hardware thing, because uh, I've noticed the yeah. same thing. I mean, I, I, I built a bunch of radio stations in Mississippi that I'm part owner of, and we built them with cheap, refurbished Dell desktop machines. We had cables everywhere and power supplies failing left and right and hard drives, you know, every once in a while would, would, uh, would fail. And then we bought, honestly, some refurbished Dell servers. Some people like Dell, some like uh, HP, some like a Ford, some like a Chevy. And, and uh, right. I've just been so impressed. I mean, I, this open, and I know I sound like such a noob, right? C coming into the world of hey, servers, but I never worked at a radio station that could afford these things. And so we bought literally some, I think we, by the time they were all tricked out, maybe about a thousand dollars for mm -hmm. what would a few years ago have been a five or $6,000 server. And uh, we've put all our stations, but one on this one particular server in terms of the Rivendell playout systems. And they've been fabulous, just fabulous. Uh, uh, problems have just gone away. Of course, they're rated and dual power supplies and and, and all that. So uh, anyway, I, I, go, go ahead. You, yeah. you tell me about your hardware experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the thing is for us was we're noticing as we would buy a system, it would come in and it, I'm you know computer geek. I'd love to pop the case open, take a look inside, and see what's in it. And there was times where it's like, oh, well, I know I've seen this stuff before. I just fixed my relative's computer and it had that they got from Walmart. It's the exact same board in here. So it's like that, that doesn't give you a very warm, fuzzy feeling inside. So what we've done instead is we use uh, HP Enterprise servers. Um, ours are DL560 Gen 10s. And... You know, you mentioned dual power supplies. Ours actually have four. We can lose oh, up to wow. two power supplies and still operate just fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's got dual Xeon processors and that operate at 3.2 gigahertz. I can put two more in there. So if I ever needed more space, I, you know, processing power, I can have it um, for a price. Uh, it's also, they each have 256 gigs of air correcting memory. That's something you don't get in your typical PC is, is, you know, the old IT adage is like, well, have you turned it off and back on again? What you're doing is you're clearing the RAM, clean, cleaning it out and putting everything back in there again. ECC RAM goes, hey, there's something wrong here. And just like you have a RAID for your hard disks, it knows that there's something wrong there. 
will either try to repair it or refresh the information, ask for a refresh of information. So you don't have that. It's like, man, this thing's just really wonky right now. You know, I, we've never had, I'm never going to say never, but yeah, rarely do we have a situation <laughs> where, you know, it's like, man, this computer's just acting really weird. Let me just power it off all the way and back on. And, hey, it's fine again for six months, you know, before we have another problem. You know, rarely do we see that anymore. So, and the other thing is, you know, we deploy external storage from our um, hypervisor from VMware. So, and it's a tool, it's a dual 10 gigabit link down to 24 solid, or no, we're upgrading to solid state hard drives because of the sheer amount of VMs that we're running, because we plan on at least another 10 more this year. Um, but right now they're just uh, Seagate Barracuda 15,000 RPM drives. I can buy them on eBay for, I think it's 200 bucks a piece. A little bit pricey, but these are, you know, IT data center grade drives. So, and we utilize ZFS file system on top of there, just using free open source software. And that's the best part is really the price in this has just been in us buying the support contracts for VMware and the hardware. Um, of course, you have the cost of support contracts for your other stuff, but you know, the software we have on our storage system, it's free. It's Linux based. Actually, it's BSD based. Um, mm -hmm. It's ZFS. I can do snapshot. I do snapshots every hour. So if I were to be attacked by ransomware, okay, I roll back an hour or two and I'm back on the air. It takes five minutes to do a rollback. So I'm not too concerned about that stuff anymore. <laughs> um, and, and there's been times where we had to do that where it's like, okay, there's a machine. It, it, we've never had a ransomware situation, but it's like, man, I really messed up a software update. I need to start over from scratch. Well, I'll just roll back an hour, start all over like it never happened. I uh, did that once with the automation system. I installed something I was not supposed to and, and it took it off air. It's like, okay, switched back up, roll back to the previous snapshot, away I go. Um, that's not something you get wow. with... Uh, just uh, a regular desktop computer or a physical machine. I mean, if you do, it takes a lot of work to get it set up. But, and the other great thing is, you know, when you go to do your data backups and you just back up those snapshots. So it's like, oh, I, for some reason, the entire array raid failed. Okay, well, I can repoint it to this backup and boot everything back up like, like nothing happened and it doesn't know any difference. So give me an idea of uh, how many um, uh, virtual machines will you put on a single server? Mm -hmm. That really depends on the system you're trying to use. Um, we have the, our systems with uh, their Intel Xeon processors with hyper threading that gives us 72 cores per machine. That's quite a few. And so we can run, easily run 100 VMs, I suspect, before I have to upgrade the processing power in these machines. However, my desktop computer right now, which is an AMD Athlon FX85, whatever, um, I have four virtual machines running on there. I'm not having any problems or any slowdowns. Hmm. Um, I'm actually using a virtual machine right now to communicate with everyone here so oh my goodness wow yeah um, <laughs> um i want to i want to ask chris a couple things so we're, since we're talking with kevin bunty here in zanesville ohio and and uh, you know back in the mid 90s chris uh when i went to work for scott studios in fact chris that's when i met you at abc radio networks <laughs> um uh I, I noticed that uh, when we visited big city radio stations they they wanted to replace they want they wanted some kind of digital replacement for cart machines. They didn't want an automation system per se. Uh, whereas the small market stations, you know, they they wanted to, to automate. Uh, of course, they they wanted to you know they couldn't get people in there or they didn't want to have people in there. So, Chris, what what's been your experience in a big market, New York City, on this topic of virtualization? 
Oh, everyone's uh, – the virtualization here in the city is happening. I mean, I talked to several folks who have, are using it on different platforms. I, mean, I use it at my place for a couple of things. And, and, you know, just as Kevin pointed out, you know, we've had issues with either corruption on files or possible, you know, malware. And we just roll back, you know, delete the file, whatever you want to call it, and go back to normal and everything's great. Um, but over the years, it's always been, you know, redundancy, toler fault tolerance – and a lot of the early technologies in the virtual world when they were coming out were so geared toward, if you will, uh, the enterprise platform outside of broadcast that a lot of folks were sort of leery about whether or not it'll work. So now it's the tables have turned. And as Kevin pointed out, you know, he's running two, four machines, VMs on his desktop in the office. He's got two dozen running in the back for everything else. It's, yeah, it's just a question of what, what you want to commit. You know, it's no longer a need to worry about, well, I don't know, it's a new technology kind of thing. No more. You know, I mean, there's big dollars involved as far as what can go wrong, but now you can implement this stuff with such fault tolerance, it's not even a question. Ah, uh, okay. So that, to me, that's the key is fault tolerance. Actually, the key for me is learning how to do more of this stuff. I mean, I, I've got parallels. Uh, that's a virtual machine on my Mac here. Uh, but other than that, I really haven't played much. We, we have some virtual machines at my radio stations. I'm not the guy who set them up. And I can go in and use each virtual machine. And I know it's virtual. And we're doing streaming and we're doing um, uh you know, our automation playout systems. Um, so I just feel like I've got a lot to learn. And that's one reason why I'm excited to have Kevin and people like Kevin on the show to, to talk to us about this, you know, get me motivated to, uh, to find out what I need to do to start learning about this myself, how I need to get my feet wet. We're going to talk about how Kevin got his feet wet in a few minutes. Kevin, I, I wonder if you could, um, uh, before we go to our next break, paint any more of the picture uh, of, of actual operations. In radio, you said you've got Audio Vault Flex running mm -hmm. uh, on in, in virtual machines, and you've got what the, the WheatNet IP audio driver. So that just Correct. spews out, you know, WheatNet mm -hmm. streams on your, uh, on your, your AOIP network. I guess, is your AOIP network separate from your regular business network? It's a separate VLAN, but it's okay. using the same switches. Um, exact same switches, uh, HP Enterprise, or now Aruba 2920. Um, Wheat, uh, Wheatstone actually says, you know, they recommend Cisco. That's what they support. And I was like, no, well, I'm glutton for punishment. I'm going to put it on HP switches instead. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have no problems with that. Um, what we have coming out of the VM host is we have two network cables coming out, go, and they're running at 10 gigabit each um, with a switch that I got off eBay uh, with 10 gigabit network cards that I got off of eBay. Uh, you'll see a theme here <laughs> and <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. There's people here who's like, okay, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to upgrade this stuff. I don't, I don't just, just get this out of the way. I'll buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we run 10 gigabit in, uh, we use probably 20, 30% of that network capacity. So we got plenty of room to grow. And what that's allowing us, so we don't have any audio drops or glitches or oddities with, like sometimes you would with audio over IP if you're overtaxing the network. Um, and the other thing is, is like, as I mentioned before, with our external storage from the VMs, you know, our news editors for the TV side, they, when they come in with their footage, they take their data card, plug it into the computer upload it immediately to the storage system. They don't store any of it on their computer and they edit directly from there. Um, we're only doing 720p video resolution right now, but we've tested it all the way up to 4K, no problem. Uh, we put uh, 10 gigabit network cards in there as well and ran across fiber optic cable and I know to some people it's like, man, 10 gigabit, fiber optic cable, 4K video, this is starting to sound a little pricey. And for us, I'll admit, yeah, it was a little bit when you add it all together. But the beauty of this is you can add little components at a time. And, you know, this was a span of a three-year project getting to this point. 
This so. is something that I've noticed a lot with audio over IP. And of course, I've been singing that tune for a long time working for Telos. Uh, and, and other companies are, you know, lots of people are doing it now. And now that we have AES 67 as, a, as an audio standard over IP, it makes things, you know, pretty safe to buy whatever brand you want to oh. buy. Um, uh, but what I've noticed is, and, and Chris, you've seen the same thing in, in your experiences, that if a, if a broadcaster will will go to AOIP for for their infrastructure they find that this is so useful they'll start they'll add more and more to it they may have just done one or two studios and they realize how easy this is and how beneficial it is and then they'll go whole hog and they'll add another studio another studio then say hey, let's do our phone system and they'll add you know like a telos vx system and then they got phones in all the studios uh from from sip you know from sip voip services and so yeah i i found that it that it you, you can start small and and add to it you don't have to replace everything oh, yeah. in, in one in, at one time. Chris, what do you found? I found that to be exactly the truth. Uh, you know, and, and you know the story of my uh, Axia experience back in the day at the uh, all news station and um, what we discovered we were able to do with pro and this is from the op this is from the workflow side. So the technology we all know about. Okay, you read the books, you understand it the whole bit. What we were about, what I was trying to implement was the workflow. How do we solve some of the questions that the programming folks had regarding how do we improve this? How do we do this? We want to do more of these things. So when we introduced audio over IP in the case of the Axia system and discovered what we could do remotely on location doing, say, in the case of election coverage, presidential or local city elections, we can actually put our anchors on us uh, off site and still access the entire newsroom operation through the computers that we normally use. In the case, we had Burley and then we had Axia for the other infrastructure for audio. And the fact that we could route, move things around like IFBs and change stuff around at the off-site location during the programming, the program director, the news director, the producers were ecstatic. They're like, wait a minute, we've never been able to do this before because it required another person at the other end of a telephone. Okay, switch to City Hall. No, nope. go to Democratic. Uh, com no, nope. go to Republican. Uh -huh. No, nope. you got the wrong one. <laughs> now, sitting at the producer's desk, we had a computer screen, and all they had to do was click on the little virtual boxes that are IFB routing. And they go, okay, segment 20, we're going to segment 20. Boom, 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 boom. IFB has been routed, they're going live seamless now this is you know this is way back in the early days yeah. so we'll yeah. fast forward to today what kevin's pointing out and what you're saying it's about scalability so so you're a small operation maybe you're medium or large and you decide to do a little bit of introduction of audio over ip and all of a sudden realize wow we can now do what we never could do before and then the, the wheels start to turn so that's how it goes <laughs> wow so i'm hearing interesting noises <laughs> sorry that's that's my dog Howling at the <laughs> ambulance going by outside. That's great. That's great. You have to introduce oh, to your geez. dog. Introduce us to your dog. Sometime. Oh, that's great. Hey, oh, uh, uh, so, so Kevin, uh, we're going to take a, yeah. a break, but you know, in the, in the second part of our show, I mean, look, every time I talk to a guest or talk to Chris or talk to the, the, to people, Alex Hartman, for example, he's a guy that's done a lot of virtualization. I get I get my west my whistle wetted, and I want to do this. I want to know more about it. I want to figure out how to do this. And sometimes it, it it seems like a to me it seems like a steep hill to climb to start to figure out how to virtualize stuff. And and I I guess I'm just afraid of stubbing my toe too many times. Hey, I've installed Linux 200 times, and every time I do, it seems like I I do something that messes it up, and I can't back out of it, and I got to start all over because I don't know what I'm doing. And I would like for you to be able to tell us about your own journey mm -hmm. into virtualization because you seem very comfortable with it now but i'm assuming you weren't always comfortable with it and i'd like to find out how you got from i don't know much about this to where you are now you have a lot of confidence you know what to buy and uh, and, and i love the buying stuff off ebay I, I i do a lot of that too for my own radio stations i buy ethernet switches cisco switches off ebay and, and but but i buy two you know if i need one i buy two right because <laughs> it's so cheap uh, by the way, one yes. time we bought a switch. I needed one in, in the little town of Cleveland, Mississippi, <laughs> and I needed a, a little eight port Cisco 2960 switch. And I bought one mm -hmm. and I, I got it in and I knew I was going to have to wipe it clean, you know, and then reconfigure it. And uh, this one had previously belonged to the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. <laughs> so I can't, I can't imagine where the switch was. 
<laughs> you anyway, you never know what you're going to get. Hey, our show this week, this week yeah. in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Podcasters General Store, and they represent a whole range of, of, of equipment, lots of manufacturers, almost all of them, basically. And you may want to check out the Henry Sportscaster. Let's have a look at the, the Henry Sportscaster right now. You know, the Sportscaster is an audio control system for managing the audio portion of a sporting event, radio, or video broadcast. When you use the Henry Engineering Sports Pods, well, the Sportscaster creates an integrated system that includes all of the essential audio functions, including audio mixing for air or for webcast, uh, headphone audio management distribution, off-air intercoms, that's part of it. Sportscaster is a one-box solution that's a it's comprehensive and yet it's intuitive and easy to use. Well, by integrating all these functions in one device, the Sportscaster eliminates the need for multiple mixers, multiple distribution systems, lots of headphone amplifiers, intercoms, power supplies, and complicated wiring. The Sportscaster gives you all these essential functions in a compact 1RU box. It's really amazing, especially when you couple this with, as I mentioned, the Henry Engineering Sports Pods. So you take this Henry um, Sportscaster out to a remote broadcast, to a ball game, uh, to a, you know, we're right in the middle of basketball season. And so if, you're, if your system isn't doing what you want, get this thing. Baseball season's coming up. This is perfect to take out to the ball game. Get your, uh, your your main play-by-play -play announcer, your color announcer, your field announcer, uh, your field reporter. And you can even bring a producer along and and uh, and have a producer talking to these people if you want to do that. Uh, it includes a party line intercom between producer, talent, and the field reporter. Uh, if you have camera operators, if your radio station or cable system or small TV station uh, is, is you know, uh, televising ball games uh, or parades, whatever. Uh, you can use uh, the intercom system. It's got a camera operator headphone output. It's got talk back from producer to camera operators. Uh, inputs for things like crowd mic, the PA announcer, if you want to include that. Uh, it does have a Q bus to audition auxiliary sources and a main program output, of course, to go to air uh, or go to a streaming device. Just so many, so many cool things about this. I mean, the options the, op the options that come with it are, are just amazing. You know, Hank Landsberg, he's the owner of Henry Engineering. And those of us who have been in broadcasting know that Hank really thinks out his products. He thinks about what does the broadcaster need to absolutely get this job done uh, in the most flexible way, but also in an easy way. I mean, Hank's gear is always easy to use. So uh, I think this, <laughs> this is just an amazing device. I mean, H uh, Hank put a lot of thought into the Henry Sportscaster Sports Broadcast Audio Control System. Where do you get it? Well, you can call our friends at Broadcasters General Store, BGS. Uh, their phone number is 352-622-7700. I've got it memorized. How about that? 352-622-7700. Or see them on the web at bgs.cc. Not .com. It's .cc. If you call them, and that's the way I like to deal with BGS. They are so friendly. Every one of the salespeople has got this amazing computer system, uh, custom software that they've been writing and perfecting over the years to get you quick information, quick availability and ordering information, the best pricing. And then when you're waiting for delivery, they can tell you where it is, how long it's going to take to get there. If it's overnight, if it's available in a couple of weeks, just what the deal is. Um, I, I love these folks. Good people in Ocala, Florida at Broadcasters General Store. Thanks a lot, Henry, H Hank Landsberg, the Henry Sportscaster, and BGS.cc for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Bunty is our guest today. Uh, Chris and I are talking to Kevin about virtualization. Yes, it's a topic we've talked about a lot. And you know, one reason I'm passionate about this is because I know that that's where we're going to be. I mean, when you order... When you deal with your bank online, do you think they're running little you know, Dell or HP desktops uh, running their website? No, they got they got servers doing that, and they got backups of servers. If something dies, bam, they can switch over very quickly. Um, almost any online service you're dealing with uh, is doing this. You deal with Netflix, you deal with Google, you deal with with any company, and even small companies that are have their websites and their functionalities uh, hosted. Uh, by a data center, you know there's more than one thing running. I mean, they, they've got they've they've got backups, or most of them do. And I really believe that that broadcast infrastructure. I mean, not only do I believe that it, it's moving there, and I believe that someday we're going to be very much there. Now, does that mean less interaction for talent? It doesn't have to. I mean, it could, but 
talent can be just as involved uh, in a future where things are virtualized than they are now. In fact, it can be even easier. I mean, how'd you like to, instead of doing your morning broadcast uh, from a fixed studio in a building somewhere downtown, you can do your show as well as you do now from a coffee shop or from your own home or from, a, from you know, you set up a, a pop-up radio station in a park because all the cool stuff that you need and that you deal with is, is, is all in a data center, punch it up, deal with it, feeds happen automatically, stuff gets ingested and you're there controlling it. You've got your microphones, you're talking to people, whether they're local or remote. What I'm saying is we as broadcasters can really use this technology to make better radio than we make now. We really can. Uh, now, <laughs> it's like anything, sure, it can be used for evil too, right? We can you know, fire all the disc jockeys, turn the switches on and go home, but then who wants to listen to that? And we already have that in you know, Spotify and Pandora, right? So I'd love to see a world where uh, our talent uh, has a, just has a really easy time making all this happen. And, uh, and we get lower costs and higher reliability and ultimately, ultimately better quality. So, Kevin, um, like I said, man, I, I, I want to learn how to do this. And now I want you to take us through your own learning journey. And let's see if that's maybe an option for me or other engineers out there. How would you get started in this virtualization? Well, two things really quickly. You said you always had a spare Cisco switch, spare network. Uh -huh. <laughs> Have them on there hand. Know where they're at. Uh, the other thing is, is where you mentioned is like, oh yeah, doing a show from the coffee shop or something like that. You know, we're in Ohio. We get snow. We had a footfall in one storm sometime this year, you know, this winter. And uh, we have it set up where our radio pr program director who has a morning show on our AM, she did it all from her house already. Uh, same with our morning uh, FM guy. He did it all from his house. He didn't have to come into the studio. You know, we didn't do it live, live directly from there, but we had it set up. So he just recorded real quick, sent it off, dropped it in the automation and away he went. Nobody knew he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to be. Mm -hmm. But how I got here was a little bit of trial and error. Um, when I first started working for this company, I was actually a master control operator on the TV side. And I've worked my way up to chief engineer. Um, and... I was always fascinated with computers. I went to DeVry University and for electronic computer technology. And so I was always had this fascination. And that's kind of the key that you have to have this fascination you want to know. So I made friends with the IT here because they were, they were in a different department, actually. They weren't within engineering. Um, so I made friends with them, just kind of curious on what was going on. And they have started slowly incorporating some virtual machines into their things. You know, they started off small, slowly grew, grew, and grew, and grew. I think by the time that they left and I took over, um, they, I think they had probably, I want to say, just under 20 virtual machines running, doing various things. Some of them probably only got used once a month. Others was the main website. And... So when I took over, I had to learn some of this. So it was a little trial by fire. And, and I was also the only person here. I took over engineering and I had no help. And I'm running an AM, FM, two, well, three FMs, an AM and the TV side. And the classic engineering tale of being at six places at the same time. Um, and as I was just kind of maintaining the virtual machines at the time, I really didn't understand them all that well. And as I started, you know, just being exposed to it more time, I realized this does allow me to be in six places at the same time. I can work on this machine while I'm on this machine while I'm on this machine, you know, and I was just changing tabs in a browser. And it's like, okay. And then I had of unbeknownst to me, I don't know why he really wanted to work here, but he did. I'm very thankful that he did is uh, <laughs> there was a computer shop here in town. They closed down. He was looking for help. I brought him in and um, he had experience with this and I learned quite a bit from him. And now we're on about the same par and as engineers, engineers love to do. Now we argue back and forth on how it should be set up. And, <laughs> but I'm the boss, so I always win. 
<laughs> and uh, so that was very helpful with me. And whenever he wasn't around, you know, after hours, you know, because my brain's spinning, it's like, okay, what else can I do? What else can I do? You know, I was surprised on how much information really was available online. I mean, it's just a quick Google search. It's like, how do I do this? And, you know, the places I went to the most was YouTube and Reddit slash R slash Home Lab. And, you know, there's just these people who are truly just trying to see is like, okay, well, we want to do this in a commercial setup, but let's see, you know, can you do this where you run a storage system in a virtual machine that's connected to another storage system? And it's like, uh, I don't know why you would do that, but here's how you would do that. And, you know, then you always get people arguing back and forth. It's like, well, maybe this would be an actual example of why you would do it. And so that's where I learned a lot of my information from. And then just getting my hands in there and, you know, making mistakes, sometimes intentionally mm -hmm. making mistakes. It's like, well, I don't know what this does. Well, let's go find out. And it's like, oh, I just crashed everything. Let's not do that again. <laughs> Good thing for backups. Um, fortunately, I only did that once. Um, but and it was just trial and error. And as I got through, it was like, none of this is as hard as I originally thought it was. You know, and I know a lot of, I've came across a lot of uh, engineers that are like, Bruh, why would you virtualize that? Too many eggs in one basket, as you referred to earlier. And I'm realizing it's like, yeah, it's a lot of eggs in a basket, but it's also made out of titanium and, you know, good luck breaking it. If you break it, good job. You really messed it up. <laughs> so, um, for, that, that's kind you know, of my I see story here. on how I got into that. Yeah. I kind of see a real parallel here um, when, oh gosh, it's 15 years ago, when uh, uh, we started introducing the notion of audio over IP to engineers. Uh, and I was going around demonstrating audio over IP systems um, uh, at, at SBE meetings and to, to broadcasters. And you know, at that, at that point, a lot of engineers' experience with computer networking um, was frustration. When a salesperson would call and say, I'm hitting print, 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 and it's not printing. I, pr I clicked print 50 times, and it didn't print yet. And then you go find whatever the problem was, usually a paper jam in the printer. And then, you know, guess what? You get 50 copies of that sales proposal and wasted a whole lot of paper. My point is that is that our experience as engineers, broadcast engineers, with computer networks 15 and 20 years ago was not always very happy. We may have had some crummy gear. We, uh, one time I had a little uh, Ethernet switch that, that just decided one day to start spewing garbage all over my network, right? And so everything came to a grinding halt till I figured out what it was, disconnected it, then everybody was happy again. Uh, so we had that point uh, for a lot of us. A lot of us didn't get comfortable in putting, wait, you mean I want to put my radio station's audio over a network? Are you kidding me? I have trouble printing over the network. And once we showed them the more professional grade hardware, uh, Cisco or other you know, high end switches properly configured uh, with quality of service being uh, specified and obeyed. And we find out that, hey, this actually does work. It works really, really well. Uh, sure, I can do things to mess it up, but I can do things to mess up in the analog or AES EBU digital world, right? And so, so now, um, and I realize there's plenty of industries that are well ahead of broadcast. But speaking as a as a broadcast engineer myself, um, you know, I'm I'm comfortable enough that that virtualizing the job of lots of individual computers and systems, it probably can be a good idea. I just got to get understand how to get comfortable with it. So I'm not using a Walmart router, right? In you know, or the equivalent thereof in a virtualized system. I want to use the good stuff that's known to be reliable and, and known to be good. So that's what I'm you know, working on discovering. Um, Chris, I'm guessing you kind of went through a little bit of the same yourself, where you were used to the, the old uh, crummy or consumerish version of some technology and said, wait a minute, we're going to use this for broadcast. Oh, wait a minute, Chris, I forget. You're always on top of the latest technology to, to use for broadcast. That's, that's what you do. 
<laughs> trust me, trust me. There's been a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, and uh, you know, uh, what do you call stub toes, if you will. But in the early yeah. days, yes, when networking and, and IT or, or MIS for some that really remember back in the day, um, it, it, the understanding of what Ethernet could do and how it functioned was so. Uh, foreign to many folks that in broadcast where we're so used to and it's just by design mission critical always on uh there is no you know send resend uh, acknowledgement packets there's no tcp you know concepts it's all udp once it's gone it leaves the studio once it left the transmitter it's gone there is no handshaking to try and understand that this new technology ethernet has all these things and oh by the way the collision light on the switch it's okay if it's flashing because that's actually what it wants to see but yeah a lot of folks i mean we i remember working at one place and in, and remember back in the early early days of switches and i'm sure kevin remembers it knows this too you didn't have the ability to block or properly pass packets from port to port so everything was just a flood and sometimes you could flood the entire switch legitimately if you will but the the onboard processing of the switch was so uh, you know, um, rudimentary or, or in a, incapable of handling, the switch would just collapse. And you wouldn't know that because everything downstream was going berserk. So you're going after that, thinking the switch is normal because the lights are flashing. So yeah, there was a lot. There was a huge lear learning curve. I mean, I remember folks using switches after the switch. You know, one, two, three. I remember one place I went to. They were having issues with the traffic system, Marketron, I think it was, and Marketron worked just fine. And when it wasn't connected to the network, why? We had three or four switches cascading all the way down the hallway to extend wow, the Ethernet yeah. cable. <laughs> That's what I was told was the reason. But oh, anyone God. knows that if you start cascading switches, what happens? But think of it back in the early days when the switches were very, you know, weren't designed to handle a lot of things that we put them to in the broadcast world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's come a long way. But now... Today, I mean, I, I have no problem putting things on a network and doing a lot of stuff. And I always say, and I've had calls from folks, you know, which is the better one to get switch-wise or a router? What should I do? He said, I always say, look at the application. Do not look at price alone and understand that, you know, what it is you need? What type of switch? Layer 3, layer 2? What are you doing? What, you know, what's important? Just like Kevin pointed out, he has 2920s from Aruba. And others may say you should just go with Cisco. Well, you know, if you look at the specs of two of those products, they're very close for the application you need. You may not need to go crazy. Maybe some place you do have to do Cisco because that's your corporate policy. End of story. I get it. But I've I've put the equivalent of HPs, the old Pro Curves. I, matter of fact, there's one on. I have one in operation right now in Iraq at, at a transmitter facility, testing out some IP audio uh, audio over IP distribution. So uh, I'm using a Pro Curve, and it's working just fine. And even though they're a Cisco house, they were very upset. I said, look, for what we're doing. This is doing just fine. If you want to buy a Cisco switch, feel free to get it. Otherwise, I'm not spending the money for something that's just doing literally uh, 256K of audio over IP. I'm oh, not going to spend yeah. you know, $10,000 for switches to connect it. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Kevin, you uh, you alluded to uh, looking up uh, videos on YouTube, and my goodness, yeah. I, I've been able to do that for a, a lot of projects around the house and fixing cars and <laughs> things like that, uh, and also uh, some some a lot of information on Reddit. And uh, what what was what was the uh, the subreddit you referred to? Uh, home Lab. Home Lab. It, okay. So, yep, what do you lab. learn on on, on Reddit slash was r slash r slash Home Lab? I uh, found out, you know. Us as humans, we can be pretty rude at times, to put it gently. Uh, also, <laughs> um, there is, if you just scroll through there, you'll see an, all kinds of crazy scenarios that you never think about. And you go, huh, I, I, I never thought of that. You know, that may actually work for something for this system over here that I have. And it's like, and I'm, go, I'm now I'm like, okay, well, I look at computers and every type of machine I have in my plant here, and I go, do I really need a piece of hardware doing this? So, mm. you know, any chance I could get to get rid of something, I'm going to, but I'm not just removing the physical aspect of it. You know, we have satellite delivery for um, our TV side. You know, mm -hmm. it had a, um, had a full Dell server, and we've gotten rid of that now just by having to get a little bit, little crafty with the, uh, the network aspect to get it to work with uh, DVB dash IP. And so it's getting an IP signal from a satellite connecting into our switches, sending it to the virtual machine 
and storing the satellite programming, which we then run it through in a transcoder and get it ready for our video playback system. And, but, you know, there used to be a box dedicated just for that. And, you know, I had a question. It's like, hey, I need to get DVB IP, which is TCP without the return authorization because it has the additional checksum put in it. I, I still don't fully understand that part, but somebody's like, oh yeah, here, just do this and check this setting, check that setting, make sure you set your own VLAN for all that. So you don't get any stuff you don't want on that network to get in. And that was it, you know? Mm. So it's just, uh, you- there's a lot of helpful people out there, but you know, take some of it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, like advice you find anywhere on, on the internet. Yeah. W- one thing that you mentioned briefly was that you had uh, your your business phone system virtualized yes. running in, in a VM. So you have something like mm-hmm. what, Free PBX or something like that running? Free PBX. It's exactly okay. Free PBX. And we have uh, SIP.us as our SIP trunk provider. And okay. yeah, it was a direct plug and play. And it was actually a lot easier than another um, physical uh, voice over IP appliance that I helped set up in another company here in town. And there, you know, you had to go through manually enter and everything. And because it was their own proprietary system uh, with the free PBX and with our SIP trunk provider, they're like, Oh yeah, here, go into your uh, system update panel, click mm-hmm. upload module, apply this module, apply it. You know, then type in your password and away you go. You're done. So I, uh, and then it's the beauty with the open source is that everybody yeah. can write modules for everything. Yeah. The last uh, two, three days here, I've been at, at Telos. So I've been you know setting up our NAB demos that I, was, I mentioned. Mm-hmm. So I, actually one for NAB and one for uh, Broadcast Asia. And the NAB one, we have free PBX running uh, in a virtual machine on some computer that's also doing a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and for Broadcast Asia, we're running free PBX on a Raspberry Pi, and, and that's going to provide telephony example connections, you know, uh, between various mm-hmm. devices. So it, it's not like a whole office uh, worth of stuff. Um, so let's get back to the, to the notion of, of if I wanted to educate myself a bit, let's say I've got a cast off computer. Uh, some you know mm-hmm. some some desktop computer. What I heard there's a free version of VMware like VMware ESXi Correct. or something like that. What 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 what's out there that I, what should I get? Or, or there's Proxmox, there's a virtual box, there's a, you know virtual mm-hmm. various virtualization things. What what do you think I should start with and start playing with? The easiest one to start off with, I would say, is virtual box. Um, hmm. Matter of fact, the the we use for our storage system here, we have Zigma NAS with our own customizations applied to it, but it's got virtual box built into it. So you can load that up there, throw a couple hard drives in there. You can have a home NAS ready to go and you can run a couple of VMs right on top of it. Uh, at my house, I actually have an old derelict computer that I got off of a relative. I can't even remember which one now. And I'm running the Zygmunt NAS on it. I got a whole bunch of used hard drives just from, and the typical IT cliche is like, oh, you know how to fix a computer here. Can you fix this? It's like, "Mm, that's broken in half. No. And, or I won't. So you Uh just take, you know, any spare parts you can get, you throw it in there. But in the virtual box appliance in there, I have my router. I use OpenSense or sometimes mm. PF sense. I, I go back mm-hmm. and forth uh, as my router software. My daughter loves playing Minecraft, so I have a Minecraft server <laughs> running. I have a remote administration virtual machine running. So you know, if I'm at home and it's like, you know what, I'm having problems um, accessing this IP IP of ours internally. I want to see how it does externally. I can log mm. into that, run a um, end mapping tool and go ahead and see what ports are open. If I set the router up properly, or if there's a connection problem or whatever, you know, I could do that from there. And, uh, you know, so there's four machines running off of one and that CPU and that machine has a total, um, I forget the terminology, but it's a 
TPW of it's a how many watts it's consuming is 17 watts. Hmm. Um, okay. I have 16 gigs of RAM in there, and it's a very low power machine. Uh, I have a I plugged a kilowatt into the thing, and when the hard drives are idle, it's consuming pro- just over 25 to 30 watts of power. You know, I spend start watching a movie that I have stored on the hard drive that goes up to about 100 watts of power, but you know. It is saved so much. I don't have to have all these extra computers running. I don't have all this fan noise. I don't have to have a, um, you know, I don't have to have my cable modem. I don't have to have my um, NAS at, you know, that I have for home to store our pictures. And I don't have to have this Wi-Fi router. You know, it's like, oh, they stopped providing software updates for my Wi-Fi router. So now I have to go to the store and buy another Wi-Fi router. I don't have that anymore. So it, it makes it's a little bit of frustration at first to kind of learn it and get it set up. But once you get comfortable with it, it, you know, it's like, Oh, okay. Well, my router died at home. Okay. I'll go ahead and set up this VM here real quick. Then you got the catch 22 is like, okay, how do I download the software if my router's not working, but you figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) So the laptop to Starbucks. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. I've done that before. I've done that before. I've actually gone to a coffee shop and blew out the operating system on my computer, reinstalled Linux, with just using their Wi-Fi. It was 20 minutes past closing. They're like, sir, can you please leave? <laughs> so, I'm almost done. <laughs> almost done. Let me finish. <laughs> Gosh, gosh. Hey, we, we got to so, take our last break. Uh, 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 Kevin Bunty is with us. So is Chris Tobin. We're talking about virtualization. And remember, Kevin's in a small market. He's in Zanesville, Ohio, which is market a TV market 200 plus, right? What about 210, 209, 208? Uh, 209, like 208, something like that. I haven't looked it up recently. Yeah, so. It depends on if the visiting basketball team is in town or not. It's, it's not, a, right, not a huge right. place. <laughs> uh, we're, so we're talking about virtualization <laughs> kind of, and dinner. how to... Yeah, exactly. All right. Our show this week in Radio Tech. Oh, stand by because we each have a tip of the week coming up. And uh, uh, Chris, I'm sure, has a good one. He always does. Uh, Kevin Bunty is going to have a good one. And I've actually got a tip of the week this week. So we'll be right back. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo at lavo.com slash twerk. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But, have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features the jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes, and enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo Radio Tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And do go to the website at lavo, 
lawl.com slash twert. If you go there, it'll take you right to the radio equipment, and it'll let Lavo know that uh, you heard about it here on This Week in Radio Tech. So thanks so much. All right, it's time for some tips of the week, and I'm, I'm going to run first here uh, uh, just because I got the stuff real handy here. Um, so today, in setting up for my uh, podcast, I made a, a big boo-boo. Okay, so I've got this mic arm right here that I'm not using because – I some I've I've keep forgetting to bring the collar for this that adapts that size. I think that's about a six millimeter stud uh, to adapt that to a standard. You know I don't have one here handy to a standard uh, mic holder, right? Which with that that big really tiny thread pitch that's always easy to cross thread. Uh, you know standard mic thing, and so um, and I couldn't find an adapter anywhere. So I couldn't use this thing to hold the microphone. But, oh man, what am I gonna do? Well, I, I've got a mic way over here. Let me grab it. Uh, I could have I could have handheld this mic. Uh, and, I've, and I have before in the past. I've also, but I, I just didn't have a good way to hold it. I didn't want to handhold this thing the whole time. Well, I, guess what I got with me? I've got this Sennheiser um, wireless mic and I've had the best luck with, with this Sennheiser wireless mic. It's just been really awesome. Um, let me, uh, Take care of that. Uh, it's been really awesome. Uh, now they're they're not cheap, but they work well. So this is the Sennheiser AVX series, and uh, I've talked to Sennheiser about this. They they warned me that well, it's great for voice. It's not actually full audio spectrum because it actually uses the same chipsets as the DECT DECT telephones. So uh, they do, they weren't designed to be 20 kilohertz bandwidth. I'm not sure what they are, but I think they sound pretty good. So if you're doing, you know, uh, video recording, and in, in my case, uh, the uh, the receiver is just down here by my side plugged into a USB adapter for my laptop. But this little guy here is what I'm transmitting with right now, and the microphone is, is on here. Here's what the receiver looks like. I've actually got two of these. So here's what the uh, the receiver looks like. You may have seen these before, and they do have a, an XLR connector on there and about uh, 15 hours worth of battery time with a rechargeable battery that's right there. Uh, you can, And then here, I also have the handheld version right here. So you can pair these together. Um, or you can unpair them. If I need to pair this one with the other receiver, it's easy to pair. Uh, this one also lasts uh, oh, a good 10 or 12 hours of battery time. And um, anyway, it works really well. So I've, I've used them typically with video recording, but today, the easiest thing to do was to just put the lavalier mic right here and uh, we're transmitting a grand total of about a foot and a half from the transmitter to the receiver. But it does work. And it, it really saved my bacon today when I didn't bring the right hardware to mount a microphone. So uh, th they're anywhere from $700 to $1,000 for a for a microphone and the receiver, depending on if it's the handheld mic or the, uh, the belt pack, which is pretty spendy. But you know what? You can easily go spend two and three and four thousand dollars on wireless mic systems like they use at, at the TV station where uh, where I do some work at. So you, you can spend a lot more, and these are really really good quality. So I guess for the money, they are they're pretty darn good. So the Sennheiser AVX series have saved my bacon several times. That's my tip of the week. Uh, Chris Tobin, have you got a tip for us today? Well, you know, I, it's a tip technology. We're talking networking. So uh, I've been working on a project, and it's been pretty cool. I'm actually using a product, an application called Zello, Z-E-L-L-O, and it's an internet uh, two-way radio setup, or actually it simulates a two-way radio concept, but it's it's over the internet. It's all IP. So if you have a uh, iOS device or Android, this is what it looks like. That's oh. the uh, push to talk button. Yes. And then if you want, you can actually purchase. They have radios, internet radios that actually look like a two-way radio, but it's over the internet. So... Uh, I have a friend of mine who's at the other end, somewhere out on the end of Long Island, which is 123 miles from here. Let's see, 702, 702, 722. Let's see if we get anything. Uh, 722, this is 702, I receive you. Okay, that's over the internet, over Wi-Fi here in the apartment, and he is out in a place called uh, Sag Harbor, Long Island, so that was over the internet. And that's using a codec that's pretty close to G.722. So you take that and attach it to one of your traditional RF radios. Okay, this is just a regular RF. And now you have yourself an extended system. Now, why would I explain and show this to you? Take, take for example, this week, and I'm going to be doing a broadcast for a sports group, an internet group, and they have several people running cameras and producing and stuff. Believe it or not, the easiest thing you can do is rather than use a cell phone, I hope that's working in the basement of the sports bar, which is not always the case, you take these little devices and you create a conversation group. 
And when I press the button, all of a sudden now, all five phones or whatever devices can hear me at once. So it's like a producer's cue. I thought it was pretty cool. At first, I was like, eh, this is nothing. But there is opportunity here. If you're a radio station or even TV facility and you've got stuff going on and you're trying to figure out ways to communicate that makes sense rather than tie up your two-way gear if you have it, this type of technology might make sense. You could use uh, your smartphones. You can get dedicated internet radios. And by the way, this device in my hand supports 4G LTE, SIM cards, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, and uh, Verizon. So you can actually use the data plan on your cellular card and make this talk on over the internet. There's a whole, I mean, there's a whole industry out there with this stuff. It's pretty wild. Um, just throwing it out there, just for anyone interested in trying to do something different and figuring out, you know, cell phones are not always, the, smartphones are not always the best way to communicate inside your building and running around because it's just what it is. But this is pretty cool and the quality of the audio is spectacular. And latency, uh, it, it actually does a test. I mean, this, this connection is showing latency of 42 milliseconds. So. Wow! No, it's wow! So yeah. I just I just downloaded the app. I'm signing up now, so we'll, we'll give that a give that a try afterwards. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's, that's, so that's Zillow with an E, not not Zillow. That's the that's the real estate of, of appraisal and sales correct. site. It's <laughs> Zillow yeah, with an e. e. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's very right. handy. It's actually it can open up opportunities and ideas. And I've been this weekend will be a first test that we're going to try some wild stuff. So we'll see how it goes. I've been missing my Nextel push to talk, so maybe this will replace that. Right. It could. It could. All right. Kevin. Kevin Bunty has been our guest uh, from uh, Zanesville, Ohio. Kevin, have you got a tip to leave with our viewers and listeners? I do. I don't know if many people think about it very often, though. But, you know, we have these tower sites sometimes out in the middle of nowhere. Um, don't forget that these will actually make very good data backup points for, to have an off-site location. So you don't have to pay a... You know, you don't have to pay Dropbox or Google or Amazon to have a backup. You can actually go ahead, find some free software. You know, I mentioned Zigma NAS earlier. Find an old computer. Take it down to a tower site. If you have a point-to-point -point data link with a Ubiquiti or we use Mimosa, you can have set up your own personal little cloud data backup location. Back up your personal stuff or back up the business stuff. You're, you know... Hopefully it never happens, but if your studio ever were to burn down, you can still have a copy up of all your stuff, all your music, all your liners, all your ads. You can all have it right there ready to go. And then if you do the virtualization, you can actually spin up a VM right down there, and then you're back on the air from the stu uh, from the transmitter site. So that's that's a great idea. You know what? I've got a lot of the infrastructure to get that done and haven't done it yet. So shame on me. I need to get that, uh, need to get that accomplished. I'm in the same boat. Sites. Yeah. Yeah. We, hey, we have the stuff there, so, but you know, someday may come along sooner than you, than you want. So good idea. Use the yes. infrastructure you have and, and, and a cast off computer and a NAS or you know, hard drives in it. Hard drives are fairly cheap now. So it's, it's worthwhile. Save your bacon. Save your bacon. <laughs> Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Kevin Bunty Not from, uh, is it WHIZ Media? group is that it that's correct whiz media group all right well, so we'll look for you keep facebook and then uh, let us know what what you're doing i'd love to hear your opinions on stuff hey no problem i'll catch you at nab or, oh yeah that's right yeah we'll be out there so yep. we'll see you there in about a month mm -hmm. and uh, chris yep. tobin thank you for being here and uh, chris in, in the sur surely on an upcoming uh, show we'll get to hear about your uh, adventures uh, in the basement Yes, I will. I will document and make notes, and uh, definitely, it's it's pretty wild. This opens up some opportunities, at least some of the work that I'm doing. And, and I think others, if they look beyond the the proverbial box, you'll see that this makes sense, and it's cheaper than uh, paying the the, the cell rates that you have to pay for phone calls. Ah, okay, all right. Well, we'll we'll look forward to that uh, that too. All right, hey, uh, we got to go, and I uh, really want to appreciate uh, uh, thank uh, Kevin Bunty uh, Bunty and uh, Chris Tobin for being with us today. I'm Kirk Harnack. I've been doing the show, hosting it here from the Telos Alliance in Cleveland, Ohio, from their demo room here. Uh, I want to thank Suncast, our producer, for producing the show today. Thanks so much. And uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. Uh, we're going to be back next week for another edition, another episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks a lot. See you next week. Bye-bye.